think we have a critical mass here. So good evening, welcome. I am Kimra McAfee, Executive, Executive Director of Alpine Watershed Group. And we are very thankful that you're joining us tonight for our second forum in the West, Cor West Fort Carson River vision project process. Um, I was really excited when I saw the folks registered tonight. It's exactly the sort of breadth of audience we've been hoping for. We've got community members, we have uh, regional board staff, there was an environmental protection agency staff person signed up, partners, friends of Hope Valley, uh, some of our Alpine County Board of Supervisors, whether or not they're wearing that hat tonight. And so I just want to thank you. I know there's a lot of Zoom meetings right now, and, and it's really important to us and to the Regional Water Quality Control Board to get all of um, the interested parties and the stakeholders at the table. The first order of business is to introduce our new staff person. And that is Watershed Program Assistant Kai Osgathorpe. And uh, Kai, you wanna wave? Um, Kai is primarily at the beginning going to be working on restoration planning through our US Bureau of Reclamation Water Smart grant. But tonight she is wearing the IT hat. And so she's managing this Zoom meeting. And we thought it would be better for her to wait to say some words and introduce herself to the end of the meeting when she's also going to talk about our path forward. Um, her job is getting everyone admitted. And we've found these last few meetings, there's a lot of folks very uh, last minute trying to get on or having issues. And so she'll be helping facilitate that. So our agenda for this evening, we're going to start off with Cindy Wise with Lahontan Regional Water Quality Control Board. And she'll give us a refresher on the vision project process and some updates. And then I'll just briefly give an overview of the restoration projects. And then our two main presentations, which will be picture heavy and very engaging. We have Sally Champion with the US Forest Service. As I'm sure many of you know, the vast majority of land in Alpine County is publicly owned. And about 88% of that is US Forest Service lands. So it's, it's very fitting that uh, we would have US Forest Service anchoring this meeting, talking about both restoration projects and roads. And then Alpine Watershed Group's Mo Loden is going to show us all uh, photos and talk about the process for the Hope Valley Restoration Project that just got completed. And we also have some drone footage from Shane with Carson Water Subconservancy District, who's also on the meeting tonight. And then, as I mentioned, Kai will wrap it up with a next steps. And let's see. Oh about questions this evening. I think all of our speakers, if you have a question, if something was unclear, you can fill, you can write it in the chat, you can unmute, you can raise your hand. We'll try and keep an eye out for chats and unmutes. We will have questions and answers at the end, but as long as we stay on schedule, I think we can also field questions as we go along. And that is all that I have. So I will turn it over to Cindy Wise. Okay, thanks, Kimra. And I believe Kai is going to graciously operate my slides for me, please. So you might just need a minute here to. There we go. Uh, good evening, everybody, and thanks for joining us tonight. As Kimra mentioned, I am Cindy Wise with the California Regional Water Quality Control Board, and I saw that one of my colleagues, Mike Hanks with the State Water Resources Control Board is also uh, um, participating tonight. And I'm also expecting Dan Sussman on our staff to join us too. Um, tonight I'm gonna give a quick overview of and an update on our West Fort Carson vision project that will be followed by lots of interesting information on river restoration and watershed. And some of this vision project information may sound familiar to some folks tonight, because I've talked about it before, but I did want to make sure that everyone joining us this evening has a common understanding of the vision project. 
And before I start, I do want to give a special thanks to Cameron Mo and to Kai with the Alpine Watershed Group for all their help and good ideas, both for tonight and throughout our So the next slide, please. And this is just a little recap of the mission of our of the state and regional water boards, and it is to preserve, enhance, and restore the quality of California's water resources. So our primary responsibility is for the protection of water quality in California. And we also implement state and federal water quality laws and regulations. So next slide, please. And for the regional boards, one of our main tools that we use to carry out our mission is our water quality control plan or our basin plan. And the basin plan assigns beneficial uses to waters in the region. And it also includes three different types of water quality objectives, narrative, region-wide, and site-specific. And these water quality objectives are based on historic water quality data, and they often reflect the pristine condition that we're lucky to have in many of the waters in um, the island. And the water quality objectives are what we use to assess current data to see whether or not water bodies are impaired in the region. So next slide, please. And this is kind of the process we go through to determine impairments. We uh, collect water pollutant data, we collect water quality data from both um, internally and external stakeholders. We assess the water quality data to, against the water quality objectives in the basin plan to see whether or not we're achieving those objectives. And if we are not, we're required by the Federal Clean Water Act, Section 303D, to maintain a list of impaired waters for the region. So these are waters that are not um, meeting our objectives. And once a water is on this on the 303D list, we are required to address that impairment by either preparing a total maximum daily load, TMDL, or an alternative action plan or regulatory action. And we um, include this list of impaired waters, which the list is updated approximately every three years, and we include it in what is called the Lahontan Region Integrated Report because it's integrating the Section 303D list of waters and also our general assessment information under 305B of the Clean Water Act. So next slide, please. And for a water to be on the 303D list of impaired waters requires three levels of approval. The first level comes at the regional board level, which our board took action in November of last year. Then the next level of approval is by the State Water Resource Resources Control Board, who is our parent agency, and they just took that action to approve the list last month, so at their October board meeting. And then the State Water Resources Control Board will pass that list along to US EPA. Uh, and they're expecting to get it to US EPA by the end of this year. And then the EPA has 30 days to act on that list. So we're expecting that action to take place late January to early February of next year. So next slide, please. In, our, in, in the integrated report or the 303D list that was just approved by the state board and the regional board, we segmented the Carson River into three different segments to assess the data. Um, so the, in this, slide just shows you the three segments. So we did headwaters to the east end of Hope Valley, then Hope Valley to Woodford is the middle segment, and the lower segment is Woodford to the Nevada state line. And what's listed there are the water quality parameters that um, are not meeting the water quality objectives. So next slide, please. 
And so why do we care about these listings? Um, there are potential consequences of them. For example, excess nitrogen and phosphorus can cause some uh, harmful algal blooms there, and other kinds of algal or microphyte growth. There could also be low dissolved oxygen in the water. Um, indicator bacteria can, uh, can be um, indicator of potential human health effects from using that water. And then turbidity has um, impacts to aquatic life, aquatic habitats, and could also impact municipal use. Next slide, please. And possible sources of these impairments are listed up here. Uh, you can see um, there's a variety of things that, that can be going on. So for example, for phosphorus, and uh, nitrogen, it could be due to erosion, uh, stormwater, uh, fecal coliform could be septic systems, like recreational use of the watershed, wildlife um, sources or livestock waste, and then things like turbidity or chloride could also be um, caused from erosion. Next slide, please. And so for the West Fort Carson, instead of doing a total maximum daily load or TMDL, we are developing an alternative restoration plan or what we're calling a vision plan. Next slide. And the vision plan is a term from US EPA and it's a, a watershed wide planning effort to improve water quality. And the main advantage of having a vision project instead of a TMDL is that there's more flexibility um, to improve water quality than the constraints of a TMDL. Next slide, please. And we chose the West Fort Carson because there was a lot of data. There's also a lot of active public and stakeholder involvement, both with the Alpine Watershed Group, uh, Friends of Hope Valley, the um, Carson River Subconservancy, for example. There was also a lot of uh, restoration work that is planned and underway, and we'll hear more about that in uh, just a little bit. And go on to the next slide, please. Uh, we also had two main assessment and planning documents. One was the Carson River Watershed Adaptive Stewardship Plan, and then also the um, Upper Carson River Watershed Stream Stream Corridor Assessment. Um, the Stream Corridor Assessment is, was a state study that was uh, completed in 2004. And the Carson River uh, Adaptive Stewardship Plan um, by the Carson River Coalition and Carson Water Subconservancy was first um, done in 20, 2007 and then updated in 2017. Um, so we had some good uh, baseline uh, assessments to start on for our vision project. Next slide, please. Um, for the Nevada side of the Carson River watershed, uh, US EPA uh, considered that their adaptive watershed stewardship plan met its nine element watershed planning criteria, but it did not have enough information to pass that Test that test for the California side. So, um, next slide, please. So, what we're hoping is that our final vision plan will meet that standard of a nine element watershed plan because that makes it eligible for potential future funding sources from um, US EPA under Section 319 of the Clean Water Act. And it also um, just makes for a more comprehensive as watershed assessment for the, um, for the river. Next slide, please. And as we said, there's been some uh, forums already that we've done on public. So there's a strong public participation and outreach element. Um, as I said, and Kimra mentioned, we'll focus tonight on restoration. Last September, we focused on roads. And Kai, at the end, will talk a little bit about our next forum, 
which we're thinking will be recreation in March and then potentially looking at ramping in um, May if COVID with a tour if COVID and the weather allows. So uh, that's really all that I had. Um, the next slide just has our contact information and also the website for the vision project and where you can get on our electronic um, subscription email if you want to just stay advised of what we're doing with the vision project. So um, thank you. And does anyone have any questions for Cindy before we move on? Okay. I, I have a question. Yes, Rich. I'm Rich Harvey with the Watershed Group. I'm not clear how the US uh, EPA can approve the Nevada side of the watershed, but not the California side. Surely things are not getting any better as the water moves downstream. Um, it was more based on the level of specific information that was in the watershed plan for the Nevada side as compared to the West Fort Carson on the California side. So what we're hoping is that the vision project can supplement the, the good work that the subconservancy already has done on putting their plan together and that we would have a, um, a complete assessment moving forward. Any other questions for Cindy? Thank you. So as Cindy and Kai and I were talking about this themed restoration project night, I offered to go into the Carson River watershed adaptive stewardship plan and just try to pull out the restoration projects because they have several tables that include completed since 2006, 2007, current, and then planned. And um, it gave me a greater appreciation for Carson Water Subconservancy District staff and how they try to bring together all of the entities and all of the projects throughout the entire watershed um, and how difficult it is to get folks to feed in their information and then to have consistency across that information. So the good news was, as I, I pulled these together, it, it did match up with our planned agenda for tonight. I did not include projects that were purely water quality or purely invasive plant removal or purely fuels reduction. Um, so these are more restoration bent. The, the first project, the Rivers and Ranches, that's the project that Cindy alluded to that we're hoping to hopefully have a tour of in May with COVID and weather allowing um, so that we can have kind of a, a tell on what can be done on ranch lands based on what was done in the past. And then as you know, we'll hear about the Upper Hope Valley Meadow restoration and the latest Hope Valley project. Um, and then, Upcoming projects or those lab labeled current are in the planning uh, close to implementation phase. So Sally Champion will also talk about the Faith Valley Meadow Restoration Project. And then that final uh, project listed, the West Fort Carson River Habitat Improvement Project, that was the one that really gave me an appreciation for CWSD trying to get all the information together because sometimes what we see in tables doesn't really align with uh, what other entities know is happening or what projects are titled. And so it's, it's, a, it's a little confusing and it's a dynamic process. And with that, I just wanna say, if there's something you know about that is really a restoration project and isn't on this list, uh, whether it happened before 2006 or it's off our radar for the West Fort Carson River watershed, please let us know because this table will feed into the, the vision plan document. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Sally Champion so we can hear about roads and recreation on Forest Service lands. All right, and I'm gonna share my screen really quickly because I have her slides. So let me get that up. Okay, can everyone see that? Yes. Okay. Awesome. Um, hi, I'm Sally Champion. I am the hydrologist for the Carson and Bridgeport districts on the Humboldt Toyabe National Forest. And I believe I probably have worked with or met with 
um, a lot of you that are on this um, Zoom meeting. So I'm gonna start off by talking about roads. And um, basically forest, we have a lot of roads. Um, all forests have a lot of roads. I think we're one of the largest road owning agencies in the country. Um, anyway, so Kai, if you could put on the map. So yeah, this is kind of a long map. You're probably not seeing a lot of it. But um, I asked our GIS specialist to put together a map displaying the roads in the um, West Carson River watershed that are national forests. And I know you probably won't be able to really discern the differences, but we have um, various maintenance levels from level one, which is closed roads or um, either they're closed because they're just no longer used or it could be administrative use only, all the way up to level five, which is paved. Um, the Blue Lakes Road, interestingly enough, actually shows up in our database as a level five road, even though we all know that's really not a forest service road. Um, so Kai, if you could then put on the, the mileage. So I just wanted to give you an idea of how many miles of road um, the Forest Service has in this watershed. And this is really only the mileage um, in Alpine County. There are a few areas outside, I think around Kingsbury Grade that also add mileage to this. But um, it surprised me that actually the biggest chunk was, the, um, was level one. But really close to 100 miles of road on national forest land um, in the watershed. So let's go to the next slide. And so one of the first efforts, well, I don't know if it's the first efforts, but back in 2013, the district took on looking at the roads in Alpine County and we did what we called a route adjustment EA. And one of the tables that actually Kimra asked me about was table two, which displayed the roads that were um, designated to be closed or reclassified. So I was hoping to go through this table and add a column that said, yes, this action has been done um, or not, but it turned out to be a little trickier than I anticipated. Um, I could not, I don't have access to our roads database. Um, and the person that does is not around right now. So I tried to cross reference against our MFUM and the other map and it just became a little complicated. But um, it's certainly something I could work on if people are interested in seeing that as a follow up. But um, I think it was about close to 17 miles of road that we said we would be closing um, under this action. So the next slide, Kai. Um, and I'm just showing you this slide. This is one of those little road segments that is designated for closure. Um, and it, it gets worse as you go on this road. Um, this is really not the worst photo. So let's go to the next slide. Um, another way we can address roads is through um, individual projects. And so this takes us to the Faith Valley project, which we're currently working on. Um, and this is that segment of road that um, borders the meadow and parallels Blue Lakes Road. And there's a lot of um, dispersed camping off this road, but we also have some big problems with drainage on this road. So let's take a look at the next slide. And also you can tell we've lost material that, you know, there's a difference in grade. Um, and you can see campers there in the back. So we've been working with American Rivers and um, their contractor Waterways on this project for a um, little over a year now. And it's both the road and the stream channel. So the next slide will show us um, the conceptual design for the road. Um, I'm not sure how big your screens are, but um, basically what we plan to do, there's quite a bit of drainage that comes off Blue Lakes Road, 
culverts or just off the road surface, um, goes across this forest service road and then drains out into the meadow. So the plan is to address those with um, probably low rock line swells or other means of channeling the water across the road without further erosion. We'll also be bringing in material to build. There's a lot of potholes. There's places where, you know, we've lost material. It's difficult for large vehicles, big motor homes and such to um, get through some of these. So we'll be bringing some of the areas up to grade and then improving the, the drainage off this road. It's a, it's a lot of work for a fairly short section of road. Um, one of the things we aren't doing, there's also some segments of historic road. Um, we won't be obliterating that um, just to keep that intact. So that leads us to the other part of Faith Valley Project is actually working on the channel. You know, through this segment of the meadow, we have a lot of incision, the water table has dropped, um, we're losing habitat. So we decided to take this on. We've been looking at this for about a year now, um, working with American Rivers and Waterways. And I know that a lot of you have participated in the webinars and the various scoping efforts on this project. Um, so the methodology we've decided to employ is to use um, try to use more native material and what they're called is um, beaver dam analogs and post assisted log structures. And I think we have a picture of that in the next slide. This is just from um, one of the handbooks on beaver dam analogs. Now there's been a, we've done extensive scoping on this project. There was concern I think there's still concern about making sure water releases from lost lakes are able to get downstream. Um, so what we've come up with is um, doing this project in phases, which will allow us to monitor, do stream flow monitoring both upstream and downstream, and then adjust to see if we wanna make these um, BDAs lower, if we wanna make them more porous, if we wanna use the post-assisted log structures, which generally are just on one bank. So we will be, we anticipate that this is gonna be a fairly lengthy project. That's not gonna be just going in, putting in this material, the structures and walking away. This will take anywhere from three to five years just to assure that we're getting the um, we're not impacting the upstream water rights or getting water downstream to the users. Um, and oh, I just wanted to let you know that um, the Forest Service, we did complete the, the categorical exclusion for this project. We have a signed decision memo, was signed um, just a few weeks ago, and it is on our webpage if um, you're interested in looking at that. So the last thing I wanted to discuss was go back to a previous project just down the river in, um, I guess what we call this Upper Hope Valley. And that was implemented in um, 2016 and focused, a lot of the effort was focused on that one big meander band that we were concerned might cut through and then start head cutting upstream through parts of the meadow that were in really good condition and we would have would have resulted in degradation and loss of habitat. So this is just a shot of um, during construction, as you can see. Um, there's a, a lot of logs, a lot of boulders, a lot of equipment out there. So let's go to the next slide. And this was taken just, um, I think a few weeks ago. This is of that meander bin and the structures there have really held up well. It's um, so I'm pretty sure we've achieved that, that at least that objective. So, but there was additional work just downstream from here. We had a st stretch of stream that had really high eroding banks. Um, so, Kai, let's go to the next next slide. 
And this is showing, um, the idea was to construct, um, construct a floodplain that would allow higher flows to spread out more and prevent you know, further erosion of this big bank. And this just shows it during construction back in 2016. Um, and then of course, what happened was, is that that was, that was a 2016, 17 was a really big winter. So shortly after construction, we had some really big flows. So let's go to the next slide. And this, you can see some of those log boulder structures from the meander band here in the foreground. Um, but then in the upper right, um, it's kind of in shadows, but you can see part of that um, vertical bank that we put in the, um, the inset um, floodplain. And unfortunately, that section of the restoration did not hold up. Um, we really lost parts of that. Um, mostly due to the really high flows that, you know, from that winter. So let's go to the last slide. But this is showing another shot of that. And you can see some of it, um, some of it was successful, but again, we are still experiencing erosion. So, you know, I think what I learned from this was that the, the main objective we did achieve, um, putting in the log boulder structures was really successful in holding that meander band together to prevent um, you know, it cutting through and further upstream erosion. Some of the other techniques that we tried were not completely successful. And um, you know, it's something that we need to consider. Do we wanna go back there, do additional work, or do we just accept what the conditions are and see what kind of you know, further veget um, vegetation happens over time? So that's the conclusion of my talk. I don't know if anybody wants to like to ask a question now. Anybody have any questions? Hey, Sally. This is Shane Fryer with CWSD. Hey, Shane. Um, so uh, just really quick and some thoughts kind of on the lower reach of the Upper Hope Valley project. Um, there is places that it's quite intact, but um, there's still areas of uh, juke matting that's still ripped up um, and willow stakes didn't take it. I mean, literally they were pulling out as like 2017, the water happened. So it didn't have any time to season in. Um, if we can maintain monitoring on that, um, CWSD, and we can show future damage from flood events, we might be able to get FEMA money to help uh, restore some of these projects. So, okay, I would so when you say the lower, the lower section, do you mean like walking out from like where the snow park is or up by the meander van? Um, up by the meander van. Um, okay. The are showing right, right now. So yeah. I mean, people can maintain a record of monitoring on it. Um, there could be FEMA fu funding in the future for the restoration of, for the fixing of restoration pro projects. Yeah. Yeah, it's certainly something we should, I think, discuss as, you know, get the, um, the partners back together. If, if we want to pursue, you know, looking back at this section and trying to do further work, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I would be open to that. And even below this, um, they went in and they took, um, uh, it was a sod and staked it at the toe of the banks, trying to recreate that, that, that drop sod type st structure. And those are looking really good right now. So in about a half a mile below the photo is. Right. right. So down closer to like, if you go to the snow park and kind of walk out from there, yeah. that area. Yep. And those yeah, again, great. some of that was successful and some of it wasn't, but you know, I think that's kind of, you know, can be expected with um, mm -hmm. restoration. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else, any comments or questions? Zach had his hand raised next. And then, yeah, so Zach, go ahead. Hey, Sally, um, what's the plan for conveyance uh, across the fixed road section there next to Blue Lakes Road? Is it mostly culverts with your project or is there gonna be any just overland drainage features? 
Oh, yeah, no, it'll be like putting in low um, rock line swells to transfer the water across. We, we will, will not be installing culverts. Well, I think Sally's project is a really good segue into Moe's um, for a couple of reasons. One, you know, just showing that uh, things don't always turn out like we expect them to, and we can never predict the winter. And um, I think one of the, the things that really informed the Hope Valley project that Mo will talk about was this 2016 project and the high flows that were experienced. And so when Mo and I started in summer 2018, the technical advisory committee was meeting and discussing project options and, uh, and a rather light-handed approach was chosen that would be um, a little less risk, I think partially because of what happened with the high flows after the 2016 project was completed. So Mo, if you are ready. Um, before Mo starts, Christina really just had her hand. Right. Oh, thank you, Kai. Yeah, um, so Christina, you um, have a question? Are you sure? I don't, I don't, okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Thank you, I thought that was a great presentation, wonderful work. Um, I uh, wanted to ask a couple things. So there's that section that um, you showed early in your slides um, that has a lot of recreational use. And I, I just wanna flag, I think, you know, it's maybe part of a larger interpretive need. It would be really great to get a grant um, for interpretive signs because there's a lot of camping up there. And I don't know, um, you didn't speak to how many actual camping sites you're making relative to how you're controlling use on that road. And I think when I go there, one of the things that I've known from past projects is you control the level of use by how many parking spaces you make and how many campsites you're making. And that whole area is really heavily recreationally used. And so um, it'd be nice to see kind of more of a, a bigger plan. I, you know, sorry about ignorance. I don't know, maybe there is a plan, but it'd be great to hear something more on that. And then just back again to interpretive signs. I think, you know, all of this whole project, we benefit so much from interpretive signs that would show where it's come from and where it's going, because there's so much really good work. It would really help showcase it and show the adaptive management that everybody's trying to apply and all the learning and that there are successes that are part of this. It's not just the bad parts, it's kind of the whole thing. So that's all I wanted to add. So thank you. Okay, so um, you know, the road work we're proposing on that road that in Faith Valley, we're really not um, planning to impact um, recreation one way or another. We're not creating or removing spaces. So whatever was there um, will probably remain there. Um, but the interpretive signs, that is a good, really good suggestion. And um, since we will be getting most of this funding for this project will come actually probably with American Rivers applying for grants. In fact, they have a board meeting this Friday, I think, that they're um, submitting their uh, grant proposal to. And um, I think that will include interpretive signs. And one of the things we had talked about when we were out there, and I mentioned the historic roads, I think it's called the Big Tree Road. Does that sound right to people? I'm not quite sure. But to put some um, interpretive signing for that out there also. And I think, Christine, the, the topics you raise about the recreational use, that definitely feeds into the discussion we hope to have at our March meeting, because we've heard from a lot of folks that um, a lot of people came to Alpine County this summer, and we don't know what the winter will bring, but um, we'd like to have that conversation, bring in the community and the agencies involved in management to look at how to yes, have our forest, or our forest lands open to all, but also to not um, impact sensitive environmental areas. Mo, I think now, unless Kai, is there anybody else in chat or hand raise? Okay. I think we're good to go. Okay, thanks guys. Um, and thank you to 
of our previous presenters for setting me up so well. So let me All right, you see my slides all right? I think you do. I can't see anyone if you're putting your thumbs Looks up. Looks good, Mo. Looks okay, good. good. <laughs> um, okay, my name is Mo Loden. I'm the Alpine Watershed Group's Watershed Program Manager. Today I'll give you a short update on our Hope Valley uh, Restoration and Aquatic Habitat Enhancement Project. This project, this project came with those challenges as most projects do. Um, this one felt maybe exceptionally tested, not only with COVID restrictions, but then we were also dealing with, um, oops, we were dealing with uh, California's largest wildfire season recorded in modern history. So <laughs> we had quite a few things to kind of figure out. I'm gonna turn my laser pointer here. Um, so if you look here below our Alpine Watershed Group logo, you can see the smoke kind of moving in. And this is day two of construction. Um, Fortunately for us, at the time of construction, there was no fires close enough to cause immediate fire threat or evacuation and the air quality maintained well enough. Um, so construction was postponed um, due to the circumstances, but we finally got construction started on September 8th. And I wanna give a little shout out because I see Lauren signed onto the meeting here and this is a Hambridge project manager, uh, Lauren Roach, uh, providing the numerous, numerous hours of watering at site one. <laughs> So this project is located downstream of the Fourth Crossing Bridge in Hope Valley. Fourth Crossing is a reference to the Immigrant Trail. It's more commonly known as the Highway 88 crossing of the West Fork Carson River now. Um, the project area consisted of two meanders. The first project area is site one, just approximately 300 feet downstream of the bridge, and then about half a mile further downstream at site two, um, we have our second location, which is actually the 2015 American Rivers um, log crib uh, structure. So both locations are located on CDFW land. Um, the purpose of this project is to help reduce erosion and sedimentation in the West Fork Carson River at the two project locations. The long-term goal of this project is to improve water quality and aquatic habitat and create a more connected and functional channel and floodplain. Um, for this project, we assembled a very knowledgeable group of experts to assist us. This is a picture of our technical advisory committee, the TAC, um, on an on, uh, August 2017 site visit. Um, the TAC consisted of many key stakeholders who many are actually signed on tonight, which is really great to see. So thank you all for being here. Um, we've got uh, CDFW, Friends of Hope Valley, La Hunt Region Water Quality Control Board, US Forest Service, uh, American Rivers, and the EPA, and many, many more, but that's just to name a few here. So these are the um, project engineer design plans for project site one. Uh, this here is representing the Carson River flowing this way. These uh, lines right here are steep failing bank. And this was our project area. Um, project site one uh, restoration techniques were implemented to mimic an abandoned oxbow. Um, the bench here was uh, created behind the failing bank and filled with live sod blocks and willow stakes throughout the entire bench. These gray lines represent the live willow trench packs, which we'll see more of later, and the green circles represent the live willow transplants. Um, the bench was approximately two and a half to three feet deep, about 12 to 14 feet wide, and about 300 feet long. Uh, this is an innovative design in the sense that this approach allows vegetation time to establish before the project area has direct contact with the active river channel. Um, Kimra touched on a few of these things already, but I'll give another little spiel about them. Um, the design is a low impact. Um, there was no dewatering required. The design was considered low risk. Um, it causes very little impact on the river or the meadows geomorphic processes. So if erosion ever pushes back to the newly created floodplain bench, we've still created um, frog and bird habitat. So most willow live or most live willow transplants and some of the live willow stakes were installed at seasonally low groundwater level, which is a key to willow success. And currently we have a public exclusionary fence that um, actually surrounds the entire site one perimeter. Um, this fence will likely remain in place through next year until vegetation is established. So now I'm just gonna talk a little bit. I'm just gonna show you a few photos from construction and just kind of talk about kind of what was going on. So the first steps to the project, this is site one, was um, harvesting the sod. 
And um, this took, you know, we first had to go, the Hanford crew um, spent time mowing down the uh, meadow where we were going to construct a floodplain bench. And then it spent many, many, many hours, eight, 10 hours of watering the sod. And then the sod harvesting began. And we were able then to store the sod just around the adjacent area closest to the restoration area. This is um, a few photos of the actual Willow Live trench packs that we did. And uh, you can tell by the standing water here that they were actually installed down to groundwater level, which was such great news when it just happened so easily in the first one. So we were very excited to see that. Um, each trench pack has about 30 to 50 willows and the uh, willows were about half an inch to two and a half inches in diameter and about four and a half feet to seven feet long, so. This here is, um, this is a photo of the newly created floodplain bench when it's raw. And this was the floodplain bench after pretty much completion, after the sod and willow stakes have been filled in. Um, this is the green exclusionary fence that surrounds the whole site. It's complete now, but this is a photo before it was totally complete. But um, the, when the vegetation establishes, um, this feature will now be better armored for like to withstand high flows when the river reaches this area. And now with the lowered floodplain elevation, the river will actually have a more natural grade to access the floodplain. So all willow stakes and transplants were salvaged on site from nearby sources. Here, I'm gonna show you a really cool innovative technique that I'd never seen before and the waterways engineer um, had never seen before for installing willows, which is pretty cool. Let me move my... Thing. and hopefully this all goes well. It's a video, you know how this goes sometime. So this was um, using the steep house pounder was a really, really time efficient and you know labor efficient way of installing the many, many, many willows. There were willows installed throughout the entire flood vein, the fun play, flood plain bench um, about a five foot on center. So there was many willows installed here and using this steep house pounder um, gave us a lot of confidence that they were installed as deep as they possibly could be um, really with the idea that they, they're touching also the seasonally uh, low water ground levels. So. And this here is just a photo of one of the live willow transplants that were installed. There were 10 installed throughout the entire site one. All right, I'm going to attempt to go out of my presentation and come back and show you this lovely, lovely, lovely in-kind drone footage that our partners at Carson Water Second Service District provided us. This is just gonna be a little sneak peek at the footage. Um, they provided us before construction uh, footage, uh, during construction footage, and then they're going to also do after, con after construction uh, filming as well. So when that's actually available, it will be available on our website, um, which I can make available to everyone later. But let me see, let me get out of this quickly. So I think that the drone footage really does such a great job of showing the actual 
size and extent of the project better than the photos could. So I know Shane, you're on the call and just thank you so much for that footage. It's just so valuable for actually um, explaining the project in good detail. So, all right, so site two. Site two was a, rest, was a previous restoration project that American Rivers and California Fish and Wildlife did back in 2015. Um, it, so site two is actually already providing really great fish habitat, but updates were needed to divert stream energy from scouring behind the 2015 log crib structure. So a, big, a basic approach of installing slash at the ends of this reach will add the stability and needed. And this is our before construction, our project and after construction of our project. And actually um, upon further inspection of the infield conditions in comparison to the plans, it was actually decided that the upstream end of the reach was not experiencing as much deterioration as the downstream end. And so therefore 90% of the upstream work was added to the downstream end. Um, and you can kind of see that here, this is the upstream end. It's got a really nice, like kind of like natural grade here with a lot of this nice established sod. And then we have our more like failing bank down here at the bottom end. So, so the minor excavation only occurred at the downstream end to smooth out the bend and accommodate the introduction of new vegetative material. As you can see here from this sequence of photos, this is the project at site two before construction. And then this is the um, minor slight, you know, grading laying back of the bank. And then we're actually able to kind of salvage some of the sod at the meadow toe. And you can see it better here uh, and place it all at the bottom of the um, project site. And then the slash anchor logs were drilled in with this massive logger or auger. And uh, the, the slash anchor poles were basically really banged into place with this uh, big old bucket. We then were able to um, install the slash and uh, the hamper crew uh, secured all the slash with sisal rope tying it all down. So there's also numerous willow techniques implemented at site two. Um, willow fascines are willow cuttings bound together in an alternating fashion. Um, you can see these right here. These were installed near the water line below the slot below the sod and slash. Um, these fascines will provide protection for the newly placed sod, but will also potentially sprout new willows. Um, beyond that, there were live willow stakes st strategically placed along the willow, along the water line. Um, that's what I'm doing here. And um, also they were installed throughout the entire log crib site on uh, with that same T post founder you saw. And then we were um, able to confidently install some willows down to groundwater level that were actually installed with the slashing for logs because as we were drilling the holes we would come into the groundwater level which made the slashing for logs kind of like oh okay well there's a new thing to look at and try to manage and work around but so um yeah I guess just we we, we did many many types of willow uh, installations here on this site and based on previous restoration projects, we've learned that willow establishment is challenging in Hope Valley. I think it's especially more challenging to this project site where it's mostly delineated as an upland area. So we're hopeful that the more, we're hopeful for more willow success due to the many varied willow techniques. Um, the science and art of meadow restoration is continuously evolving. The lessons learned from each project contribute to the design of future restoration projects, but I think it's just really important to say that both sites, both sites turned out so well, exceptionally well due to waterways and Hanford's extremely talented, experienced staffs. So thank you guys, really appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> project status. So project status phase one planning is done, was funded by the state water board. Phase two implementation is also complete. Phase two and phase three are both funded by the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation and the CDFW Office of Spill Prevention and Response as part of a settlement of, uh, of the State Water Board. I'm sure, I'm sure some of y'all are familiar with Kirkwood pushing the gravel into the creek and that's how we got our funding for these last two phases. So the major heavy equipment of construction wrapped on October 8th with some light handwork and watering tasks extending through October. Now the snow and precipitation has landed in Hope Valley our widening tasks are also complete. That was 
it was, a, it was a dry spell there for a while. We weren't sure if it was gonna happen, but it came and it came fast with a lot of snow. So we're, we're thankful, but I would have personally and professionally would have liked a, a little more ease into winter, but um, so AWG will conduct post-construction monitoring over the next four years to assess if any adaptive management is gonna be necessary. Um, we welcome you to stay apprised of the project via AWG's project webpage at this link here. And these slides will be available later if you wanna find this link. Um, so thank you. I really appreciate everyone being here tonight and listening to this presentation. If you have any questions, please let me know. And clearly just a huge big thank you to all of our project partners. I know there's a few of you guys logged on here tonight. So just we couldn't have done this project without you guys and really appreciate you, so. Thank you, Mo. Anyone have any questions for Mo about the project or anything she explained? I'm not seeing uh, any hands raised or um, any new chat comments. Okay, then Kai. Awesome, let me share my screen. Here we go. Okay, can you all see that? Yes. Awesome. <laughs> I realized most of you were actually yeah. muted. Um, well, hello everyone. Uh, this is my first watershed group meeting and it's been awesome to see how many people tuned in for it. Um, and yeah, so at the beginning of the meeting, I was doing some, some IT stuff and sending out some emails for some, some late comers. Um, and I know that Kim introduced me, but I'll just really quickly again. My name is Kai Osgathorpe. I am uh, Alpine Watershed Group's new watershed program assistant. Um, and I'll just say it has been such a pleasure to be involved with AWG and with all their contacts that I've met. And uh, this meeting was great for um, you know, sort of putting some names to some faces. So it was, it was nice of you all to be here. Um, and my section of this meeting will be quite brief. It looks like we're on schedule to get out of here a little bit ahead of time and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, so first of all, again, thank you to Cindy, Kimra, Sally and Mo. Um, it was awesome to hear all of your presentations. Awesome, again, to be part of this group of people who were getting stuff done. Um, and they all talked about completed and current projects going on specifically in um, the West Fork of the Carson River. Um, so part of my job going forward is uh, to begin collecting ideas for future project concepts and not only for the West Fork of the Carson, but for all five of the watersheds in Alpine County um, and to begin developing those ideas for future projects out of specifically out of the wants and needs of stakeholders in these watersheds. Um, so to do that obviously requires some stakeholder input. So in the coming week, I'll be sending out a short five to 10 minute survey asking, um, first of all, what you'd like to see in the future of Alpine County watershed, so project ideas that you might have. And then second, asking for your perception of various areas of watershed health as they currently stand. Um, and then the responses that we get from those surveys will feed into our January meeting, which is on this slide. It's gonna be on January 12th, and it'll be a discussion on um, looking forward. And from what everyone has told me, um, and from personal experience, I know that trying to plan a virtual meeting with a diverse group of individuals right after the holidays isn't necessarily a simple feat. Um, so we're gonna make our January meeting really simple. We'll watch a short film about river conservation. Um, we'll probably present on the information ideas that those surveys yielded. And then we'll open up that watershed group meeting um, as another platform to share ideas. So please take the survey, share it to whomever you can, um, any contacts in the area or um, who have a vested interest in any of those five watersheds. And then again on the slide, the meeting after that will be in March and uh, Cindy alluded to it already, it's going to be on recreation and its impacts on the watershed. Um, and that'll be picking up the baton for the vision plan that we that this meeting touched on in the meeting before. Um, and so that's kind of coming out of I mean, recreation is a big thing when it comes to rivers, but also with COVID and with the ability of so many people to be working remotely now, um, we've seen huge influxes of recreators in specific areas. So it'll be interesting to see how this affects Alpine County over the winter and through the coming year. Um, and it'll be a good opportunity for us to gather, at least virtually, and reflect on the relationship between recreation rivers. 
So we hope to see you all at those two upcoming group meetings, again, virtually. And um, please take the survey and please share it. And uh, yeah, that's all for me. Again, thank you to our presenters. Um, that was awesome. And thank you to all of you for giving up your time and energy um, to be part of this watershed group meeting. And um, I think we're ready to move on to questions. If anyone has any, I know we were kind of covering those as we went along, but if you have any more, um, again, some people figured out there's an option where you can raise your hand and we can call on you that way. Um, otherwise, you can ask them in the chat or you can just unmute yourself and start talking. It seems like that's been working as well. So yeah, thanks everyone. And are there any questions? I'm not seeing any in the chat yet. Okay, well, I have one more thing to, to babble on about. Um, for those of you who live in Alpine County, you're probably familiar with the 50 plus club. And the 50 plus club is having a meeting this Thursday at noon. And Kate Harvey, who's a volunteer for the club, as well as Don Riddle with the county, they got together and they hired Ethan Craig to create a video, a virtual tour of the Grover Hot Springs State Park new ADA accessible trail. And that's the project that the state park did the trail and then Alpine Watershed Group is responsible for designing six interpretive signs with one more sign to come on the Washu people and their relationship and history with this area. So if you are part of the 50 plus club or you need information to log in, I can get that to you. And if you're not, we will have that video available once it's done, um, certainly through our newsletter, probably on our website. So I just wanted to give a little plug for that because uh, it's been kind of a soft launch of the Grover Hot Springs new trail and the signage, but it's really exciting to have it completed. And then the other thing I always like to say at these meetings is if there's something you would like to see Alpine Watershed Group cover or talk about in a future meeting, obviously Kai's survey is going to give you a specific focus on restoration projects and priorities, but anything that you would like discussed at a future meeting, even though we're on this Westport Carson River Vision Project process uh, thread of forums, we certainly always have time in our agenda to talk about other watershed related topics. So you can email myself or Mo or Kai or call the office line and get Mo. And um, I want to echo a thank you to Cindy and Sally and Mo. Uh, it's, it's always kind of a, it feels risky. How are these going to come together? And Cindy thought we might have too much and, and I'm very happy to see that we fit it all in. So if anyone has any questions, this is your last chance. Yeah, hi, Rich Harvey again. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. I had a question for Cindy on the um, issue of water rights and uh, using Beaver Dam analogs. How is that going to get resolved? Is there a conversation about that uh, going on? Because I know that was a concern. Um, I think in as the project moves forward into the permitting stage, that is something that we would look at probably as part of the um, of the sequel process. But to my knowledge, there has not been a specific conversation on that project about water rights. Um, I would need to check in with some of my water board colleagues because there is a possibility that there has been some permitting issues going on that I'm not aware of. But um, sorry, that's as much as, as I have on that. But I will make a note to see if I can find out anything else about that. Um, hi, can I can I step in? This is Sally. Um, and we have had conversations on water rights. Um, we had a conference call with Carson Water Sub Conservancy District. Um, the water master for the Carson River, Chad Blanchard, and also, and I don't have those notes in front of me right now, but um, a representative from the um, California Division of Water Rights. Um, I believe we have, I'm not sure. I know the um, Shane, you probably could discuss this with us too. Um, 
because Lost Lakes is just upstream and those water rights are owned by the Conservancy and they release it in the fall for use downstream, both in Carson City and possibly all the way down to the Manhattan Reservoir. Um, but we're hoping with this, um, we've gone in a lot of conversations with them and this making this a phased implementation where in monitoring that we have um, hopefully resolved those concerns. Shane, do you have anything to add on that? And yes, that's exactly right. So um, CWSD is not in opposition at all to the project. However, we do have a concern about the water right. Um, and we've been working with Julie a lot on this. And so for the first year of the project, there won't be any mainstream uh, BDAs placed in. Um, but many of the side streams, uh, the infeeders coming into the meadow there. Um, and during that time, we're, uh, we'll be working with AWG to monitor flows through that. So we'll be establishing a baseline for our discharges in the fall. Um, and then come the second year, they'll be initiating the first um, BDAs, beaver analogs, and we'll be monitoring during that time too. Um, and uh, we hope we don't see any significant impact and we don't think there will be. I mean, there's plenty of beaver dams as they're like in there now. So there, there's natural occurrence too. Um, but, it, you know, we have a, a part of our agreement with American Rivers, uh, our, our discussion with them is that if we do find a severe hindrance of our water right, then we'll start looking at uh, beaver deceivers or culverts or some other way to pass our water through. Or if it's too much impact to us, then um, it'll, be, it'll be stopped at an earlier phase. Thank you very much. No uh, uh, this is Cindy. I was just gonna just wanted to do one follow up comment that um, to what Sally mentioned is that if it is an issue of water rights, it would not be handled at our Lahontan Regional Water Board level. And she mentioned that there was she has been uh, communicating with the State Water Resource Control Board Water Rights Division is what I believe she's talking about there. So I just wanted to um, clarify that. Thanks. Thank you very much. Okay, anyone else? Well, thank you again for joining us this evening and enjoy the snow. Thank you. Great meeting. Thank you, Rich. Excellent, thank you very much. Nice to see you. Good night, everyone. Good night, Cindy. Bye-bye.